Have a mail? Bill Knight? You're all here. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Well, it's nice to be back at shift with all you fringe people. I kind of enjoy that. I never knew exactly what shift stood for, so now that I know that it's fringe folks, I feel right at home. <laughs> I, I got in. Someone asked me a while ago how I got involved in UFOs and what was the interest, and I had to, my mind kind of jumped back real fast. I was standing on the Great Wall of China. Anybody had the urge just to go roam in China and so forth? I was in China wondering what was on down the road, followed the wall for a while, wound up going west to Xi'an and out western China. And as you keep you know, searching for things in life, your questions get bigger. You go out there like to solve a few things like, who am I, how do I fit into the scheme of all of this, you know? And, and you find out that they're, every time you cross a border, somebody's got a whole new set of answers, knows everything about it, and thinks that they have all the answers. So you cross another border and almost have to start all over again. So there was the journey out through China into Tibet and down to Japan and over into Egypt and so forth. And after running through a few countries, I had heard that there was a gentleman in Switzerland who apparently was having uh, contacts and conversations, if you will, with someone from another planet. I thought, oh, <laughs> here's some good stuff. Let's go check that one out. So I, I saw the pictures, these beautiful, clear daytime pictures of these craft that were supposed to be from another planet. And it occurred to me if someone was really visiting us from another planet and they were human and we could speak to them, imagine what we could learn from these guys. Uh, so I set off to go to Switzerland, got there, and there was a, a farmer that lived there named Edward Albert Meyer. Most people called him Billy. Turns out he got the nickname Billy because he likes, uh, like a lot of people in Europe, they like to watch our Western movies. And he was very fond of Billy the Kid and uh, used to carry a gun with him and uh, kind of saw himself as a cowboy type. So I got the nickname Billy, and people started calling him Billy. Uh, most of all the people who know him, though, call him Eddie, because his real name is Edward. So I got to this little small location up in Switzerland called Schmidruti, which is about 45 minutes outside of Zurich. And I'm looking for this guy's place. It's not on the map anywhere. And I stumble into a little post office. And the postal guy says, well, you found it. This is the Schmidt Rudy post office. And I says, well, where's the home of Mr. Meyer? And he says, oh, he lives behind the post office in Hinter Schmidt Rudy. So I'd be looking on the map for this Hinter Schmidt Rudy, and it wasn't there. And it turns out he lives right behind the post office. So I got on down the road. Make a long story short, I went looking for him at the farm. And it turns out he'd become kind of a recluse, didn't want to talk to anybody. Uh, he'd had contacts for several years. The European press had just, you know, <laughs> done nothing but almost ruined his life through ridicule and drawing attention to him and calling him names and so forth. And so he'd had a very difficult time for a while and it kind of closed himself off to the outside world. He had pulled about 15 people around him to um, uh, kind of help him with his information. They'd been drawn to come to, to live with him. So they were all there, and uh, I had a little chat with them, and they were all very angry and upset. How dare I come to the farmhouse, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I wrote you a letter. And he says, what is your name? And I said, my name is Winters, Randolph Winters. Oh, we've been waiting for you. We have some things to talk to you about. He says, okay, let's talk. <laughs> Turns out that they were interested in me and uh, wanted me uh, to know if I could stay for a while, which I did. And uh, I stayed there for three weeks. And I painted the barn. I went out and worked with the cows and did fencing and uh, had an accident on a tractor where the tractor fell over. We had great fun as the tractor tumbled down the hill and misses and flew over my hills. I had some exciting times for three weeks. I found out we had a secret underground pyramid they had built underneath the building over there, a very large full-frame copper pyramid that you could go down into the chamber, crawl up inside of and sit down on the thing. And I tell you, you go off planet right there. This thing has an accelerator on top of it that sends your mind off into different places. When I was young, my mother taught me a little bit how the mind works and how you get outside of your body anyway, so I did my usual thing that I do. But inside that pyramid, uh, which had been built for Billy by these extraterrestrials, they told him how to build it, uh, it really accelerates your meditation and your thoughts and your, your individual spiritual powers. So there was a lot of very unusual things going on there. But you know, I didn't get to speak to Billy. He was walking around behind bushes and behind trees, kind of looking at me and watching me, but wouldn't come over and talk to me. So I was told, just leave him alone. When he's ready to talk to you, he will. He doesn't talk to uh, visitors anymore. Uh, this was in 86. The last visitor he talked to was like in 84. He didn't uh, he really want to be left alone. So I left him alone. Uh, I stayed there the whole three weeks, went back home to Los Angeles, had to go back to work. Got home a week later, the phone rang. It was the farm back in Switzerland. Billy likes you. It's okay to come back. 
but great, like I just, you know, I'm going to run right back on Monday or something. So I had to wait a few months, and then I got more and more intrigued. They kept calling me, you know, and so forth. And while I was there, they had given me this stack of notes to read. It turns out the pictures that I had seen, which I'll show you some of them in a few moments, these beautiful, clear pictures of these craft from another world, um, that was just kind of the end of the situation. As it turns out, Billy had, was brought to this planet. His spirit was put into the other side, the ring around the planet on purpose. He'd come here thousands of years ago, they said. And they pull him into life occasionally. They understand how the other side works and how to pull spirits into body when they want to. Uh, later on, I'll explain that a little bit to you if we have time or if that's something you're interested in. And it turns out that Billy's meetings or contacts had actually started when he was about five years old. He started getting these telepathic things and then visions. The voices got stronger and stronger. And when he was seven, the voice told him to walk out into the forest where he lives, the countryside in Switzerland, that someone was coming to meet him. He went out into the countryside to the designated area where he was supposed to go. And he says a pear-shaped object, not a round disc or a wedge or anything like that. It looked like a big pear. Remember, this is a seven-year-old boy reporting what he's seen. To him, it looked like small at the top and came down and came out at the bottom like a pear shape. It was chrome, very bright, couldn't look at it, it was too bright, and it didn't set on the ground, it floated off the ground, and as he was looking at it, suddenly an elderly-looking gentleman with white hair came walking towards him. He didn't even see how the fellow got out of the craft. Came walking towards him, took his hand, and led him back to the ship, didn't say a word, went inside of this ship, he was set down into some sort of a small chair. There was a device spinning around his head. Still the man had not said anything. And the device, as it started spinning, he said then everything came clear. As he was sitting in there, suddenly he, all of his former lives came to him. Who he was, where he had come from, this other planet where he had come from came back to him. They were restoring all of his memories from the previous lives that they had worked with him. They were getting him back up to speed so he could make a decision if he wanted to be involved with them again during this lifetime. He says within a few moments all of the memories came back and then they open up something very important which some of you may be working with. You may be aware that there is a language that spirit can communicate with. It's not a spoken language. It is a language of symbols. The Hindus call it the sacred symbols or combinations thereof. These are images that you portray in your mind's eye during meditation that open up doorways for you into other areas of thought. It also allows you to make connections with older life forms, your higher self, gets into your Akashic or etheric records so you can find out things about yourself and other people. But this is a language that exists in everybody. It's kind of like part of your operating system, but you've never used it. You don't know the files on your hard drive, so you never bother to go looking for it. Well, if they open that up like they did young Eddie inside the craft that day and you have full faculty of that language, imagine the things you could go exploring tonight after this meeting if you understood that language. You'd be very excited to get into a meditative state and use your new language to communicate suddenly with other life forms, people on other worlds. You can even communicate with people on the other side if they choose to answer back. So you can do a lot of things and find out a lot of information. And most importantly, you can communicate or send signals directly to creation, the creative source, which is an infinite number of spirit forms just like ourselves. We all have evolved to the point where they know how to create and run universes. And you sometimes will get answers back. What's the importance of this? This enables you to find truth for yourself, the ultimate learning system. If you have questions about yourself or life and you know the proper symbols and can open the doorways, these things are available to you. Well, imagine Billy, after sitting in this seat, it's seven years old, all this comes back to him, all the language comes back to him so they can communicate with him. And then he steps outside of the craft and is sent back home. He's standing in a forest seven years old out in Switzerland. The craft disappears. He goes back home. For the next few years, his education continues. They challenge him to remember things that have happened to him in his past and so forth, all about himself. So he has a very interesting childhood. Now, most of us, when we're eight, nine years old, we're working on spelling between the lines and figuring out, you know, four times three and so forth and doing our painting projects. Billy made it through about through the third grade. And at that point, his, one part of his mind was still learning math at the local school, and the other part of his mind is being crammed full of all these very high, sophisticated technical things that they want him to learn, as well as he can't sleep because at night the dream state is so serious and all this stuff are flooding into his head that we have a very confused young boy here. 
So he didn't finish his education. Instead, he quit going to school. His parents weren't paying much attention, so Billy would leave the house in the morning, go out into the forest, be left alone, sit down in the forest by himself at 10 years old, go into his meditative state. The stuff would start flowing in. He got educated in the forest. Billy has not lived a life at all like the rest of us. He's never had a driver's license, never owned a car. He's really never even gone into town. He's been living out in the country his whole lifetime. Then at the age of 16, Something very interesting kind of happened. On his 16th birthday, the voice he's used to hearing all the time, he thought would come in to wish him happy birthday, was getting very familiar with it. Instead, the voice changed, and it was another voice came into his head. It was a female voice that said she would take over his education, and now it was time to do some serious work. Let's leave home, the voice said. The voice told him to go to India and start studying, that they would direct him where to go. He was led out to India, to an ashram in Meruli, India where for the next three years he, sta he stayed in those areas and studied their philosophy, the different philosophies of man, went over into Tibet, crossed over there, studied with them, came back. During the three years he had almost a hundred contacts with these beings who started showing up in the disc, taking him aboard the crafts and moving him back and forth in time for his own education. When he was 19, he had to finally make the decision whether or not he wanted to go public, whether or not he would work with them to do this or not. Then they says, it's your decision. Now we're going to leave you alone for 11 years to get your life in order. You're a young man. Go get your wife. Go get your children started. Get your family started, and we'll be back. Well, he says, this isn't going to be real easy because I've already seen most of my life inside the craft. He says they have viewing screens that can show you the past or the future. He already knew who his wife was going to be. He already knew he was going to have three children. He already knew where he was going to live. He says, this isn't exactly fair. I feel like there's kind of a plan out there. I just have to kind of walk in the right steps. So he says, well, I guess I'll go to Greece where I'm supposed to go, and I'll be meeting my wife in about 14 days on the side of the road. And it happened, just like they told him. He met his Calliope. They were married on December 26th. He was 18, uh, excuse me, he was 19, she was 17. They had to sneak across the border because she was underage. He made his way back into Switzerland where he went, and they had their children, and uh, he settled down in the farm area right where he was comfortable. Uh, at this point, let me show you some of the pictures and things that happened to him. I know some of you have seen many of the pictures before, but I can see some on some faces you haven't. We'll go through those rather quickly and show you some because they're always kind of exciting to see some of the pictures. I've got the slide tray going, and I'm on a leash here. Uh, maybe someone could help me start the slide projector. And I think we'll have to slide a little bit this way now, so it'll go by this gentleman. You got to come, come to it if you want. All right, well, let's see what happens to us here if we can get an image going here. Uh, do we have any control over lights here? Yes, we do. All right, light control. And let's see if we get a nice image here or where we're at. Top row up above. There we go. Well, we can kind of see him. Let's see, this light here is kind of getting on him, huh? How about if I kind of like this? Can we see okay? Yeah. Now imagine if your young childhood has been like this and you've been in India and you come back to Switzerland where the rest of us in our normal life are you know, just getting our jobs and going to college and instead you hear the voice in your head again says it's time to come out and start the meetings again and the voice tells you to bring your camera this time or go in public and you go out to the location they direct you to this thing flies in and this is a shot from I think his second or third contact we're January 1975, out in the middle of the forest area, about an hour east of Zurich, Switzerland, and this dish shows up. Here's one of the older pictures taken in India back in 1956. Meruli, he's only 19 years old, and they're picking him up in this disc and uh, trying to educate him. This is his home where he lives now in Schmidruti, Switzerland. It's about 7,000 feet up in the hills. I took these. I stayed there for several months in the summer. Every night after dinner, I like to climb up on top of this hill because it's so pretty and just look out over the valley. You know, I found, well, I kind of lost count, over 15 people in the area and who lived there who have seen the disc, seen them come in by accident. I found uh, three people who have driven Billy out to the contacts, uh, watched the crafts come in and pick him up. 
And then one night I got to see them myself. Uh, I asked Billy if I could see them, and they came by and let me watch. I got to go out in front of the house and stand there with him and watch the disc come in and float over the house. So it's pretty spectacular when you actually see them. Here's one of the few pictures we have of it on the ground. Uh, most of the contacts were during the daytime. They were going on, on almost on a weekly basis. Billy would get this familiar cooling sensation. He'd hear the voice in his head telling him where to go. He'd go out to the area that they'd chosen. And many times they would sit the craft down on the ground like you're looking at here. They'd get out of the ship, sit down and chat. I think to me one of my most memorable memories of him telling me about the contacts is at the first meeting on January 75, a lady stepped out of one of these crafts, came over and sat down. They talked for an hour and 20 minutes underneath the tree. And Billy asked the lady, I said, who are you? She says, well, my name, you can call me, the name that I chose for myself is Simyasi. And she says, Simyasi, well, how do you spell that or what does it mean? Is that a family name? She says, no, we don't have family names like you do. We don't pass the names on like you do. We've quit doing that. Instead, um, we've evolved to a point spiritually where we are more in touch with who we are as a spirit. We understand our incarnation cycles better. So we choose names which the name identifies the path of discovery we are on and the type of education we're working on during this lifetime. And in our language, the sound, Zimyazi with a Z, means a woman with half the knowledge of nature. And that's her study. She's trying to solve more of the equations about nature in relationship to man. Well, Billy was trying to make his notes. He was trying to make some, write it down phonetically how the, the name sounded to him. So he wrote it out, S-E-M-Y-A-S-E, -S -E, Semyasi. So all of his notes, that's what he always called her. But that's uh, what she called herself. She said on that first meeting that they've been watching this for quite a period of time. Their race is quite old. They are descendants of people from the constellation Lyra. And in the constellation Lyra, they say, is the oldest known form or civilization of the human form that we are. They don't know how old it goes back. Their records only go 22 million years, passed down from society to society. In our Milky Way galaxy, the originally it is believed that there were 44 million planets similar to Earth, where the human form naturally evolved there on its own. That number has greatly expanded over the past few million years. Uh, because of the length amount of time. There's been plenty of time for races to develop, develop space travel, move out, and populate other worlds. The ancient Lyrians from the constellation Lyra apparently did this a lot, populated thousands of different worlds, and uh, because of their seeds, we have a large human population, they say, in our galaxy. The history of Earth goes something like this. The ancient Lyrians came here the first time back about 22 million years ago. None of them stayed here. There was human life developing here naturally at the time. They didn't come re return again for a long period of time. History really picks up about 386,000 years back. At that point when they returned, uh, 144,207 Lyrians came here to hide out from wars that were going on in the constellation Lyra where they lived. You may have heard that number before. It is presumed to be the number of light workers which will restore the earth back to a spiritual path. Well, it apparently refers to these ancient Lyrians who came here to hide out. When they came here, after they'd been here for a short period of time, it was discovered that they were here. They came from the home planets, found them here, took their ships and their technology and stranded them on earth, leaving them here so they couldn't return back to Lyra. In doing so, all of them lived their lifetimes out, passed over, and their spirits passed into the other side around Earth. They were stuck here. They say historically that's how the white genetic got to Earth. The original Earth humans were the brown skin race. The Lyrians brought the white skin race here. Two thirds of the white people on planet Earth are of Lyrian or Vagan descent. The other third of the white race they're not sure about. It comes from too many different areas. They can't figure it all out. The Asian genetic on Earth is the oldest in incarnation cycles. It's 5 to 7 percent older, they say, than the rest of the people here on the planet. From Sirius, we had a black race come approximately 20-some thousand years ago, a very highly developed one, brought that genetic here. We have a blue skin race that lives underground. They don't like sunlight. They have a slight blue tint of their skin. They have a large community under France, and there's a large city still in the Gobi Desert where they live. It's some very old race. It's been on Earth almost for 30,000 years. Every now and then, some of them are seen. They come out of the ground in India. Every now and then, you might even hear strange reports about these peculiar blonde, blue-eyed, blue-skinned people, which really stands out in India. So we... <laughs> 
we have quite a mixture of people on our planet. Uh, if you ever wondered how we all wound up here, it's quite obvious we all didn't come out of the same monkey, if you want to follow that line of thinking. So we're, we're moving closer and closer, perhaps, to understanding our heritage. And with some of the tool sets and things that we're learning about going inside and finding out more about our past lives, we're beginning to find out more and more that the Pleiadians are probably correct. We come from a variety of different places around our galaxy, and Earth then finds itself in a very unique situation of diverse people all trying to make it on one little planet. They said normally on a planet, when you go and they find a new planet to look into, there is one race at about the same level of evolution and one color. That is the norm. But on our planet, we've had so much interference, we now have people a very wide range of age, a very wide range of spiritual age on Earth, which makes it difficult to get along. You have a lot of very old spirits who can't get along with the young, and vice versa. Our biggest problem, they say, is overpopulation. Imagine for a moment I handed out to all of you some glasses. Remember those 3D glasses in the 3D movies? Well, imagine that I gave you something that allowed you to see spiritual energy. Suddenly you didn't see physical bodies any longer, you just saw the individual spirit. And you could also see the creational energy that made up everything around us, including the planet. So I'll pass all those glasses out to you here for a second. And as you put them on, suddenly all you will see is these little glowing images of our spiritual energy. And if, let's say, we backed out into space so we could see the planet, we would notice that around the planet Earth there are several rings. The first ring forms after the planet cools, and the very, very first forms of low single cell creatures begin to form on the planet, the first ring forms. These rings are the other sides for the different levels of spiritual life that's on the planet. They continue up to seven rings for the different life forms. After the animal kingdom, the lower orders, the life, uh, the insects and so forth are formed, the highest order of life, which is us, comes into existence. We are the seventh ring around the planet at the top. And they explain this to Billy because something pretty interesting is going on. Normally, in that other side, there's a balance of people on the other side. If we are in balance and living our lives correctly, there are two-thirds more people on the other side there is in physical body. That's because at our age of evolution, the average turnaround time on the other side is 152 years. And if people are living 70 to 75 years, then they spend twice as much time on the other side in between lifetimes before they cycle back in and come back into physical life. Our problem right now, we have overpopulated the planet so badly that there are too many young spirits on the other side. See, what happens is, let's say there's 5 billion people here on Earth, which there is right now, over that, and tomorrow about 50 million women become pregnant open up this window of opportunity for new spirits to come in. Well, with our glasses on, we can clearly look at the other side and see there's hardly any spirits on the other side. There isn't 50 million spirits to come in. They're already in body because of overpopulation. Now watch what's going to happen. As you watch the other side, you will see little dots start appearing, little glimmers. Those are brand new spirits being pulled into the other side. They're coming out of creation. Creation will sense that there are new spirits needed to continue nature's natural cycles. There's nobody on the other side. Creation flows new spirits into the other side, so the cycles may continue. But what's our problem? These are brand new spirits who haven't had any lifetimes yet. And when they come into life, there is no accumulated wisdom to provide their intellect and aptitude, so they will have a normal life like the rest of us. So consequently, we have people coming in who cannot even manage the bodies they're in. You know, they're very short on intellect and aptitude because they have no experience yet, so we probably will label them either sick, ill, uh, you know, we'll send them off to the hospital thinking they're insane or crazy or whatever. They'll have a very difficult time of it, probably die at a very young age. They see this as our biggest problem because we do not understand spiritually what our existence is about and how we really work with nature. So we're ignoring that. We seem very bent on pushing ourselves or worshiping with religions and belief structures which take us away from the basics of nature. So they see it as our major problem. And they said, quote, we see you as an insane society rushing headlong to your own destruction that could only be averted by a change in mass consciousness. That was on Billy's first contact in 75. Judging by the evening news the last year or so, they were probably pretty correct. Uh, I'll dash through some of these pictures so you can see them. Here Billy's got them parking the disc by trees. He was constantly being asked if he could put a by known object, get pictures so they could test them out. 
So he had them powered by you know, trees, fence posts, over lakes, anything that he could. Here he had the craft overhead and he was recording the sound of the ship so that if, uh, they could check out the sound to see if there was something about it they could figure out. Didn't turn out to be so. It's a terrible sound anyway. Notice this craft is slightly different, has these unusual edges on it. Um, if any of you have any context, or tonight you're driving home after listening to all of this fringe information, and you hear a voice in your head and it says, look out the, your window, and you look out the side of the car and there's a white light following you, and the voice suggests that you stop the car and get out, and you find yourself slowing down and you pull the car over the side and the voice says, would you like to, you know, they'd like to meet you, please park your car and step out. And the craft, you notice, the white ball of light is coming down on the ground about 100 yards away, and it's setting down. You quickly look around, wow, you're all alone, there's nobody out here, should you be doing this? So you feel a little ripple go through your body. They're scanning you very quickly to see what you're like emotionally, if you're stable, if you're afraid, if you're, as they put it, tipping over in your mind. If you are, which you might be getting just a little excited because it's actually happening, they will send you another feeling to calm you down and let you know all about them, that they're friendly, that this is going to be a good experience, and suddenly you'll find yourself with all sorts of courage and so forth. Find yourself parking the car, actually getting out of the car, going, can't believe I'm doing this, I'm actually walking out and meeting the spaceship. Craft sets down on the ground, lights go out, somebody walks out of the craft and walks toward you. As you get closer, you feel this ripple go through your body again. They're calming you down. What do we do when we meet somebody? We generally ram out our hand and shake hands, don't we? And then we shake and we get a feel of that other person and we check them out physically, look at their eyes and so forth. And we size each other up very quickly to see whether or not we're going to be comfortable with them. And we make a quick snap judgment about whether or not we like this person, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, they don't do that with a handshake. They do it mentally. And that last ripple they'll send through you is kind of their hello. You will know all about them. You will feel them emotionally, and they will make you feel comfortable, so there's no need for the handshake. The time they get up close, they may suggest something like, if you're not in a big hurry to get home tonight, if you'd like to go for a ride on the craft, we can take you aboard the craft. We'll take you anywhere you want to go in the universe. We'll explain all the mysteries to you. You can sit in our little education seat like Billy did, ask any questions you want, and they will be answered. All we ask to be allowed to listen to your thinking. We're fascinated by your thought processes. If we can listen to your thoughts, then we'd be glad to take you for a ride for two or three weeks. Now, if you agree to that, which most of you probably would, uh, after asking them if they could block out a few thoughts that you don't want them to listen to, uh, they say, come on aboard. You find yourself going aboard the craft. Notice if it happens to be a ship like this with the unusual edges on it. This is their more advanced ship, and it's capable of moving in time. The older ones can't do that. So your questions this way can be a lot more complicated. You might want to go back in time and watch the pyramids being built or see if Moses really parted the Red Sea or did the crucifixion really happen or whatever historically might interest you. You could possibly ask these questions and perhaps they would take you back and let you see for yourself. Well, they'd probably take you out there for three weeks. You'd have all these magnificent experiences. You could go to other planets, see other worlds, see other societies. Uh, maybe even go back in time and watch yourself being born or visit yourself when you were alive 300 years ago. You can do some rather amazing things if they would let you do them. Then they bring you back. You may notice on your chronograph watch that three weeks has gone by, but, but by now you have an understanding of time because they've educated about it, and you're not surprised if they bring you back the same moment that you left Earth time. And you get out of the ship and walk back over to your car, and your car engine's still warm, no time has passed on Earth, and you've been gone for three weeks. Now you get in your car and drive home, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to get on the phone and call us, aren't you? You're going to call somebody. You won't believe what happened on the way home from the shift meeting tonight. I've been out here, I've seen this, I've gone here, I've seen all these amazing things, and what are we going to say? Oh yeah, sure, all that happened right on the way home, right? You got any proof? You haven't been gone, you know, 20 minutes, so we're not going to believe a word that you say. If you're lucky, maybe they allowed you to bring back some samples of some kind, rocks or something from another world. Maybe you brought back some food things we don't understand. Billy has a peach tree in front of the house he brought back from another planet. When visitors come over there, they go eat a peach just to see if it tastes different. He has some unusual vegetables in his garden. On the desk in his office, he has crystals and rocks and stones that he brought back from another planet. 
Nothing that, you know, too exotic that really twists your mind too much, but just kind of different than what you're used to seeing. If you were real fortunate and had a camera with you, you might be able to take some pictures of some other places. That would be kind of fascinating to have a look at. So uh, these kind of experiences don't happen too often, but if they do, and that's the ship that you see, uh, make sure your questions are big. We want to know all about it, don't we? This is where we live. This is an artist's drawing of the Milky Way. Uh, if you flew in a craft up above the galaxy, notice out here there's a little yellow box on the bottom left there. That's where we live. That's where Earth is. By the way, the Pleiades are only 400 light years away, which means if we got in our Honda and set the speed to one light year speed, if we were traveling at the speed of light, it would take theoretically 400 light years for us to get to the Pleiades. But the Pleiades are just right there in the neighborhood. It's 53,000 light years to the center of our galaxy. So we're going to have to have a very fast ship to get anywhere. Even to get to the Pleiades, who's got 400 years you know, to get there? If we have time and you're interested, uh, the theory of the crafts, how they work, uh, how they uh, dematerialize them, and how the power system works, if we have a chance later, if that's somebody you want to know, I can draw that out for you and show a little bit about how they're designed, if that's something you're interested in. This is what our galaxy looks like from the side. It's a spiral galaxy, similar to most other galaxies. It's a very normal one. Uh, here's some more of Billy's pictures of two regular sized ships. And the notice the two on the top are slightly smaller. These are remote vehicles. They're in our upper atmosphere, hundreds of them all the time. When you talk to people who claim that they're having visions or ideas or they think they're psychically connecting with the Pleiadians or the Arcturians or something like that, in most cases it's with these little remote disks. They pick people, 20, 30,000 of them at a time, and they broadcast visions and ideas to people. They're generally never from Orion or Arcturus or Sirius or whatever like that. Uh, they find out that people are far more interested in listening if they think they're making a connection with a far off ET than they are with just with a metal disc that happens to be a mile over their head. So understanding our mental capacities, these little remote disks fly around the planet quite oftenly, sending out their ideas and visions you pick up in sleep and listening to your thought patterns. They're intrigued with our thinking, they say, because they've discovered that the average person on Earth can live 75 years and spiritually only grow six or seven months. They look at us as a spiritually dormant planet, that our lack of understanding about nature and how things really go make us more of a study than anything else. We are so misled, they say, by all of our belief structures and things that exist on our world. The time we survive through you know, our kindergarten grades, our schooling, and our early years with our parents who mislead us, you know, not, to, not on purpose, but they do because it's how they were taught. The time we get to be 10 years old, there's so much stuff in our head that we can hardly get life straight. Well, you all know how that works. You can't wait to get out of the house and go out and what happens. By the time you're 30, you run off and go to an S meeting or something to figure out what's wrong with you. Then you spend maybe go to a psychiatrist or you come to a fringe meeting like this, searching for answers. <laughs> We're all trying to figure it out, aren't we? <laughs> and usually about the time you get to about 40 or so, you kind of get a gan uh, handle on everything and figuring life out. By the time you're 50, you got it nailed, but then, you know, you're going downhill and, gee, you wish you'd have known all this when you were 18. So. <laughs> Our problem is we just need to live a lot longer, don't we? Uh, if you did have a craft at your disposal and they picked you up, you might want to go visit some of the other planets. Uh, here, Billy took a picture out the window. Right here is the top of a disc right in front of him. And there's another one up here. There was three craft. They took him to Venus, let him take a few pictures. They took him up to Mars, let him see that. They took him up to Jupiter, let him see the red spot, and brought him back. It took two hours and 35 minutes for the trip. Here's another picture out the window. This is a blow up. Uh, when the pictures were being taken back, and most of these were shot in 75 and 76, by the way. Uh, the pictures, the agencies, the CIA, and most of the intelligence community were very fascinated by this when it was going on. This is actually a computer blow up. It's a process picture. It's been digitized back in the 70s by a CIA office in Zurich, Switzerland. They were trying to understand the propulsion systems or learn something about them from these things. And this was one of the pictures they chose. Billy really didn't get that close to the ship. It's just been enlarged and filled in. But it makes a very dramatic looking picture. Uh, for those of you who might be slightly scientifically oriented, let me give you a crash course. See this bar right here? 
This is a very important factor in how what makes this ship work. This craft basically doesn't produce what we would call anti-gravity. Uh, all matter is comprised of atoms. Follow me on this. It has electrons and protons. We have electrons spinning around a nucleus, right? So the concept is that anywhere you would go in our atmosphere or in the universe, anywhere you go, there are atoms or subatomic particles that have electrons. Well, as long as you've got electrons around, one of these things will work. This device actually is designed so it will swim within electrons. That's what it's doing. Here's what happens. Down at the bottom, right here in the center, we have a reactor for power. We have a rod that goes up to the center. And up here at the top, we shoot a charge, a very positive charge. And right above where this rim is right here, the whole top of this ship, the, the surface area of the craft, a positive charge is shot out. And what it does, it charges the electrons that are flowing around the top of the craft, and it makes a vacuum right over the top of the craft. That's what causes it to lift up off the ground. Because down in the bottom, out in this area down here, the charge is all different. There's a negative charge put out by the reactor down here. There are three capacitors on the bottom, 120 degrees apart. When the capacitors fire, a, a negative charge goes out the bottom, but the charge, the capacitors do not work if the craft is too close to the ground. The planet itself grounds out the charge of the capacitors. So they have to lift it off the ground before they can have the capacitors charged up. So that's the purpose of the vacuum at the top. And this right across here is an interesting kind of metal which separates the positive charge from the negative charge because the surface of the craft is highly charged by this intense field that's going on. So you have to separate the two. We have the charge at the top, slowly lifts the disc up off the ground. It gets up about 12 feet. The capacitors down at the bottom, there are three of them in a triangle form down at the bottom, charged up. As soon as they kick in, the flow of electrons then moves down the side of the ship gets out to the edge, and electrons have a very peculiar nature, they will not turn a corner. And when electrons get out to the edge of the right out here, they accumulate. And this accumulation, as soon as the charge gets high enough and they accumulate to a certain point, a field goes all the way around the craft, and that's what you see glowing at night if you see a disc. When the field gets up to a certain frequency, voila, we've got propulsion. The ship is then isolated within its own gravitational or magnetic field, and at that point, basically, the bottom of the ship is chasing the top of the ship, which is in a vacuum, and you've got a way to move a craft around. Now, if you accelerate that with a tremendous energy force they have within the reactors inside, which, by the way, are no bigger than the size of a football, it's an implosion system with no radioactivity. You can put your hand on it while they work. They're very small. That creates a strong enough energy field that you can move around anywhere you want to go. So if you're thinking of building one, by the way, the, the more of the science stuff, how to create the charge, the voltage that you need, and the other things are on a website I put on the web if any of you are interested in that. Uh, I'll give you the address later on. You can dial in and read the whole thing, and perhaps you can build one or something. <laughs> if you do, bring it to the next shift meeting, and we'll all go for a ride. You know? uh, this is building some landing tracks. You can see them down here, the three landing tracks where the craft sit on the ground. It's kind of reminiscent of uh, crop circles, isn't it? Uh, here, Billy's got his tripod out in the foreground, and, and the crafts are off in the background. Here we've got a regular sized ship and two little ones again, those little remotes. This is a different kind of craft. Uh, it doesn't sit down on the ground. It floats. The bottom of the crafts are flat. Burns the ground up pretty good, though. Now, there's one at night. It wasn't a solid craft. It was just more of an energy field. Uh, Billy took several pictures of it. We have about 20 witnesses that also took pictures of this. It changed shape. Small objects came out of the large one, flew around the house. Uh, Billy tried to communicate with it, but communication wasn't possible. Later he was told that he had been paid a visit by a group of life forms, if you want to call it, from another world that do not exist in solid form. That there are many kinds of life in various shapes and forms, and some of them are non-physical. And the non-physical ones can move their essence or their energy field or whatever you want to call it to where they want to go. They get together in groups and kind of like jump to different places that they want to go to. Kind of like biolocating, I guess we might call it. And what you're looking at here is a picture then of, of a life form that exists in a non-physical form that biolocated to Earth for whatever reason, perhaps just curious about Billy. These are the last photo sessions taken in 1981. 
Uh, Billy's got them pretty trained by now to park by trees, as you can see, and known objects. He calls it the Italian wedding cake. The balls on top of it were experimental. They apparently have since uh, dropped that design and are no longer needed, but this is a matter displacement device. Uh, they first acquired the knowledge to transmit, or you might say teleport their crafts on their very large crafts first, and then they're downscaling the technology here to the little ones. There's also a movie film of this coming in and zipping around the tree that he shot at the same time. And here we are coming in around behind the house. How would you like this to come floating through your back window? You look out and there's coming down in front of the house. That's where Billy lives in Shmidruti. Like they say in Men in Black, some swamp gas reflected off of Venus and you got to... <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you can see, this is why this case has been about the most controversial in the UFO history, because with these kinds of things to look at and talk about, it gets everybody pretty charged up. And here they are leaving at night, taking off from the house. The film imbalance causes it to look gold. The craft is actually silver. You can see the bottom of it, what looks like some sort of crystalline objects down at the bottom with some little, some sort of etchings all around the circumference. Okay, we'll stop right there. Okay, we can have the lights back on now. Everybody kind of watch your eyes. We're back. <laughs> Myers' contacts went on till 78, ended in October 78. The time I got there, they were pretty much all over. But I didn't go there really to see the ships. My own personal interest really was what we might be able to learn from these folks. You know, it's not going to be that far probably in the too distant future. Maybe sometime in the next 50 years they are going to land on the White House lawn or somebody's going to. And we're going to have open commerce with life forms from other places. We are, we are going to meet the family man in the universe sometime. It's going to happen sometime in the future probably when after we've gone through some changes and grown up a little bit and got more responsible as a planet, somebody will probably decide, okay, it's time perhaps to make connection with us. These Pleiadians, anyway, say they're not quite ready to do that and think we're really several hundred years away from that before they are interested in any kind of open commerce. And I asked Billy, I says, why is that? He says, well, evolution comes into play here. They're a lot older than we are. They're still physical. They still have children like we do. They still have to eat, but not very much. They only sleep perhaps an hour or two out of each 24-day cycle. They don't eat prepared meals any longer. They've extended their lifespan now up to about a thousand years. So they're living in a much different kind of society, as well as the main difference, he says, is their mental. He says talking to them is like interrupting a monk in the middle of meditation or something. And then you find out the monk has an IQ of a thousand. You don't even know what to say to this person. They're tremendously intellectual. They know what you're thinking before you even hardly get your thoughts together. Uh, they are tremendously insightful about our emotions. And they look at us almost, not unkindly so, but almost more like in a, a lab experiment. Like we might look at you know, uh, some ants or a horse or something. There's a vast difference between us intellectually and mostly morally. He says they've evolved a point on their world where they live a lot different than, than we do. Uh, there's this very small population there. There's only around 400 million people on the world. We have five and a half billion people here. If you've traveled around the world very much at all, you know this is a pretty crowded place. You know. The planet itself looks like there's nobody on it when you fly up in the air a little bit. But then you go to our cities and we're all just standing on top of each other, aren't we? You think we would spread out a little bit and share the space, but of course that doesn't, that's not good for zoning laws or making money, so I guess we won't do that for a period of time. They have no major cities on their planet because, for one, they don't have economics like we do. Uh, they don't have government quite like we do either. They have more of kind of a wisdom system where they find the smartest people in certain areas and put them in charge of certain things. What a concept. Right? Perhaps if we did that. Yeah. There were two or three weeks ago when they were trying to get us to go bomb Iraq again and they were all the, uh, the sign boards were out in front of the White House. Somebody was holding up a sign which really summed it all up for me. It said, smart bombs, stupid leaders. <laughs> and I said, that is, that is the sign of our times right now. Yeah. 
they're on the media trying to convince us to go over there and bomb a bunch of people and kill them again, you know. And most of these people that are going to die, you know, we're not at war with these people. They're just, they're scrapping for a living over there trying to feed their children. So that's, that's where we are at as a country. You know, we have smart bombs with stupid leaders. And we obviously have to make a few changes there. On their planet, for instance, if you have a Department of Agriculture, we would all get together and find our 10 smartest people about agriculture. And we would put them over here in a building called Smart Guys About Agriculture. Culture, and we would ask them questions. Now, we don't do that. Instead, we hire smart lawyers from South Carolina who just allocate funds for this and then take it back for that and stick it over here. Our whole government's based on shuffling money around, not about anybody knowing what they're doing up there. So, if we would actually change our system to something like this, we may be on the beginning inroads to fixing some of our problems here. If you go to their world, it's seemingly very, very quiet. There's no cars, it's very peaceful. Billy says the people, for the most part, it looks like either they're asleep or they're all in a trance. He says they're very, very mental. They communicate very openly, like in an open consciousness, like an open phone line. And he says there's something going on he didn't understand quite at first. He says because we're not doing any of this. Imagine that all of us had become mentally so powerful that not only could we listen to each other's thoughts, but we got to the point where we could really honestly tune in with nature and understand it. You could really communicate with a leaf. And you could literally talk to a rabbit as it was walking by you. We were really tuned in with the world we were living in. And then it fell upon us as the elders of the planet to do something about a deteriorating environment. And all of us got together and we knew the answer. We knew if we took part of our mental force and projected it into the atmosphere, we could not only clean it up, but we could put an energy into the atmosphere which would help all the creatures in nature. Everybody would live longer. We wouldn't get sick any longer. Our metabolism would change. And we could control the quality of our physical life. We understood this. So we all sat down one day and said, let's do it. We took hands. We charged our minds up. We got into a higher self as high as we could. And we charged the atmosphere up. And it changed all the life on the planet. People quit getting sick. People quit being emotionally unhappy. It stabilized the planet. The food started changing so that when you ate a small pear or a peach, you no longer got hungry. You didn't need to sleep as much because there's available energy to everyone. Everyone could tune into it to become educated. There was no need for schools. All we had to do was teach our children to sit down and tap into this consciousness, and all of the knowledge of the elders would be available to them. This is how they're living on their world and they protect this mental environment. They don't let people from other worlds come and interrupt it and upset it. If you and I were to show up there with our cameras and our tape recorders <coughs> wanting to you know, have them stand in front of a tree so we could take their picture, they may accommodate us. But Billy said even when he was there, he continually felt like he had to be quiet, like he was in a church or something, like he knew he was upsetting something going on. He says they don't like a lot of visitors because normally the visitors aren't tuned into what they're doing mentally and it's looked upon like a virus or a sickness in the atmosphere when lower life forms come to visit. I told Billy, I says, uh, but I thought they'd ask you on a couple of times if you'd like to come back and live there. He says, yeah, you can do that. And I says, well, how would they do that? You being a much longer, younger life form or even me or somebody else if we went to live there, I mean, they would let us do that? They says, well, it's possible. They brought some people there. Uh, he says, they might put you in an out-of-the-way area. But he says, they have a way of redoing your thinking. They can fix your brain right up. I said, how do they do that? He says, oh, it's a thing that happens. And he talks, his English isn't very good. He says, you know, when, before you're born, when you're inside your mother, he says, between the 8th and the 15th week, is when your spirit sends the information to the mother about who's coming in from the other side. And there's a signal, a pulse signal, that comes into mom's DNA that says such and such is coming in, so we need to create a brain network that's strong enough to contain all the accumulated wisdom that's coming in. Now once the brain is formed between with mom's DNA and this new signal that comes in, he says, as the body begins to form, after about the fourth month, he says, when there is commitment, when the spirit is ready to come in and it looks like we've got to go here, we're going to have a full pregnancy, he says, then something happens in the acids in the brain. He says, there's a copy of all of your accumulated wisdom from all of the lifetimes goes into the brain and the acids in the brain. And that's what kickstarts, so to speak, your consciousness, 
creates your thoughts. That's why one child is so different than another one they come in. You got one that's screaming, wild, yelling, throwing fits. The other one's very quiet and smiling, just wants to watch television. This is what sets up your personality and your character traits when you come in. It's that initial download of your personality as you're flowing forward from lifetime to lifetime. It's your operating system that's coming into play. He says if you were to go to a Pleiadian world, they can transplant the acids in your brain and change you overnight. He says, you even get choices, almost like designer choices. What would you like to be like? They can take the acids from other people's minds and so forth and put them into your brain, and it only takes about 24 hours and you are changed. You are, most, for the most part, it's high-speed injected learning. But he says, the trade-off is you're no longer exactly you because who we are as a personality and as a character is a large reflection of what we know, how we think, and how we act. And all that's going to change very, very quickly overnight. So you would have to be willing to put up with that. You're going to go through some dramatic shifts in personality as well as your intellect is going to dash forward very quickly. So usually what they do is they uh, kind of like pick out the style that you need. If you're a scientific person, lean that way. If you're a more nature person, whatever it is you might be leaning towards, they can give you these kind of injections, so to speak, slowly over a period of few weeks and very gently change you into a different person. You get up to their speed mentally. And the nice part, he says, is as soon as you pass over and finish that lifetime, it carries forward. That wisdom carries forward into your spiritual self. They'll teach you how to do it. Then your next lifetime, it sticks. So you, in effect, kind of taken a shortcut in the evolutionary cycles and skipped a few lifetimes down the road. So there are potential shortcuts, and it is quite possible to do that. Um, I think what I'll do here, I've got some movie film, too, of the crafts flying around, and then I want to do a little drawing and go over some of the uh, mind and spirit things, things we've learned from them about how levels of consciousness and thinking and so forth. I didn't get to do any of these things the last time I was here, so I thought that might be kind of entertaining tonight. But before we get to that part, any questions you'd like to ask about ships, Pleiadians, landings, anything else? Anybody got a question about anything? You want? I'm open to ideas. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, what, what kind of uh, contact have you heard in still happening, say, in the last year and a half or so? And are you still in contact very much with Well, I was there like 86 or 90. Uh, Billy's, all these pictures were taken 75 through 78. The last photo session you saw, that last ship was in 81. Uh, after that, he has had a few sporadic contacts, but not much of anything. In 80, when I was over there, now Billy told me they weren't coming by anymore. He was not having any more contacts. He would have what he called social calls, where every now and then he would feel them in his head or they'd talk to him in his head. You might see the disc over the house for a few seconds. They would just kind of check in on him. But the organized, ongoing contacts for his education and our benefit were all over. They weren't going to do that any longer. They'd stopped doing that part. While I was there, I did get to see ships a couple of times. In the last two or three years, the people that lived there at the house with Billy say that he's had a couple of more contacts and they've been written down in notes. I read them. Frankly, I don't believe them. Uh, I don't think they're written by Billy, for one thing. I think people around the house who have more of a vested interest financially or trying to proliferate the contacts. Um, Billy, no one's met Billy. You wouldn't know if he wrote it or he had not. No one would know unless you understood him and his personality and how what he's really like. Uh, a sad situation has kind of fallen in over in Switzerland. We have a group of 24 people who own the rights to Billy now. They have since 1984. It's an organization called the FIGU. I was a member for three years. The FIGU is in charge of all of the information. Billy doesn't read the mail or do anything anymore. He's just not that healthy. They have got into a situation where they have discovered they can make money by selling the information. And now it's $10,000 for a franchise fee if you want to start a FIGU study group and $680 a year for members to pay dues to mail over to Switzerland. And when they found out they could get into that and money started coming in, things have shifted. So we have a situation where the human element has come into play and we don't have this you know, warm, cozy little spiritual environment over in Switzerland any longer than used to be there 10, 15 years ago. So it's become kind of a machine now. It, it almost seriously borders... I hate to use the word cult, but they've gotten so closed-minded about things that it's, it's going that direction. They're no longer open to other people's interpretations. They're mad at everybody, and it's, it, it isn't a real healthy situation any longer. I, I kind of gave up communicating a couple of years ago. It was, all I was doing was getting into arguments with people. Either they're mad that I don't come over anymore, or they're mad I wrote a book, or they're mad I'm doing this or that. And I, it's not why I went there to begin with. 
I was just a traveler on the road stopping for my own personal experience in education, much like you go to the pyramids or the Great Wall. You go to benefit yourself and to learn and keep moving on. And they were mad at me for stopping in and moving on. I, <laughs> I, I resigned from the group in 1990. I wasn't mad at anybody. I just didn't want to be part of this group attitude any longer. I started getting nasty phone calls just because I would talk to other people and they didn't want me doing this or that. I says, this is getting really out of hand. You know, I says, I'm not a follower type, quite plainly. I'm a, I'm a road traveler. I'm a troubadour, if nothing else, or a vagabond. So you got the wrong guy to try to control and put the screws on. So then they sent me like a five-page contract to sign that I wouldn't talk to anybody and only do what they told me and blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of chuckled and laughed. That's this last-ditch effort of a desperate group. <laughs> so I made a nice videotape, sit down in the living room, thanked him very much for the experience, but resigned from the group and thanked Billy for the experience and I uh, haven't been back over there since. So. So I'm just still going down another road, still looking for things, you know. Anything else you want to chat about? Have you got some uh, contacts on the play? I did at Billy's, um, and, and they were in such an unusual way that it's, uh, it sounds pretty strange. I can't do it on my own. Um, when I was young, my mom, uh, my mom was part of what was called the National ESP Board in the 60s. We had a guy named Harold Sherman, Little Rock, Arkansas, was teaching the government what ESP was. My mom was one of those five people they brought in, it was clairvoyant, and underneath it all was the government trying to see if we had these unique people who could see what the Russians were doing or whatever, you know. My mom could see what was going to happen tomorrow. She couldn't see beyond that, like short range, clairvoyant type. And because she could do things and was very into it, at an early age my mom taught me all about the crystals and floating things and where the different areas of your mind are. So I knew a few things when I got there. And Billy recognized that right away. And when he did, he says, how much do you know? And he said, down, we begin to talk. And I found out he knew a lot more than I did. Uh, but I understood the basics of it. So he says, try doing this. And he would give me some mental gymnastics to do with symbols to see how strong I was. And then I would get in the pyramid to try it to see if I could cause things to happen and so forth. Well, I got to a point after a little while that uh, he would say, well, I'll meet you tonight. You go to bed and I'll give you the symbol to use and I'll meet you and we'll go aboard the craft. He says, okay. So I would go do my breathing things I was supposed to do and I would invoke the symbols and lay down and do my thing and get into my blank mode. Then I would hear his little bitty voice, hello Randy. And <laughs> the first couple times it happened, I jumped up, I thought he was at the door, it kind of spooked me. But he wasn't at the door, he was up there waiting for me. And Billy gets out of his body as easily as you and I walk out the front door. He gets out of his body and then he came to get me. And after I, I didn't do it right the first few times and I got onto it, then next thing I know, I'm on board a craft that it's like you're a fly on the wall, no one talks to you, addresses you, and I would watch Billy communicate with them, but no one ever would look my direction. I never felt anything. I was strictly there as an observer. And I don't know how he actually did it, uh, but I can't do it on my own. I never got to go out on a craft on by myself physically or anything, but I had months of experiences like that. And mostly I was told uh, the reason that they would do that without having gone through the early childhood of opening up the, the spiritual language in my mind, they said that most of the people on the planet who are of that old Lyrian genetic are older than most of the other people and if they are buried inside them already in their spiritual side are the old memories of the Lyrian lifetimes and as Lyrians they've already lived on worlds that are far more advanced than the one we're on right now so it'll come to them easier so they said all I really needed to do was be exposed to the ideas and the whole chapter would come back to me so that's kind of what happened and with me Billy would just give me a few things and kind of grin and says you got it and I'd say yeah he says go outside and figure it out I'd go sit down and think about what he talked about and I could walk back in and explain it to him for three hours stuff just started coming back very fast so he says we don't need to teach you as much as we just need to wake you up and once you're awoken then you can go do whatever you want to with it so that's the kind of context I have yeah, yeah. well um, when you talk about Illyrian um, or other cultures or whatever, yeah. other aliens. Um, if, we, if reincarnation is a fact, I mean, you, you can't tell what a uh, Lyrian, I mean, a, uh, what do you call Lyrian? Lyrian. Uh, by walking down the street. Because, no. Uh, 
bodies are not going to be all in one. Right, we're all mixed up. <laughs> no, we have no license plates, uh, anything there. No, we can't really. <laughs> Uh, for the most part, the ancient Lurians, when they first came here, uh, stood out quite a bit. They were seven to nine meters tall. They came from different worlds with different atmospheric pressure, so they'd be easily spotted. Uh, he says this is what went later on to much, much of the Greek myth and the folklore about the giants. Uh, the Lurians also are the people who in the past have taken earth people and mixed them with fish and with animals and other things creating the old stories of mermaids and different things. Those things actually kind of happen. But their bodies, after a few incarnations, will deteriorate down to normal size uh, because of the sun that they're living with, and it will come back down. So, no, we can't really. And because we've mixed up seven or eight races on Earth that are now even more than ever beginning to intermarry and mix up, uh, there's another big problem, which I'll explain with, uh, after the break, about how our spirit doesn't go in the right place. We're doing that a lot. We're, we're getting people out of their normal paths where they're not coming in where they're supposed to and when they're supposed to. And that causes problems and puts them within different families where they're out of step and so forth. So there are things that are going on. And I, I'm going to explain that to you in natural order on the second part here a little bit. Yeah. You uh, get two questions. Yeah. Hop <laughs> uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, what's, what's your current feeling on the uh, Florida connection that you, that you report to Kyle a little bit on the past? And if you're still in contact with it, feel good about those uh, connections in Florida. Has there been any kind of mental uh, communications that have come through? He's referring to a case I looked into in Miami, Florida a couple of years ago. There was a fellow that came forward said he was having contacts with the Pleiadians and had some pretty good pictures. Some of them, the pictures were good. Some of the others looked very homemade. Um, the pictures that I liked, I listened to his story and put a video out called the Miami Contacts. And as things will go sometimes in life, made a little error there. The tape had only been out about six months when I discovered that three of the pictures at the end were fakes and that the craft that was supposed to be flying along beside him down the freeway wasn't a craft at all. Instead, it was a blimp from Virgin Light Ships in Orlando, Florida. So I kind of stepped in it there. So when I found that out, I confronted him with it, and things didn't go well from there. They went downhill even more. Uh, as I found out, the person who helped him put together the videotape he supplied me came forward and said, well, he cut out the strings on the other part and did video effects. Those were fake. As it came down, it looks more and more like the gentleman had one or two contacts the early pictures, which I like to begin with, and I don't think they ever came back. And after that, I think he's taken, like some people will do, to manufacturing them for personal gain or for personal, you know, uh, recognition or whatever. And I've, since I've gotten to that point where I just told him, left it kind of open, says I would love to examine your case more if you can supply, you know, genuine negatives and so forth and proofs we need to really look at the case. But at this point, it looks to me like you're just manufacturing things and make it up, so I'm not wasting any more money on it until, you know, whatever. So I've just kind of left it open and nothing's happened for the last year or so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to be into making pyramids years ago. I've done some rather good sizes. I had a three quarter inch copper plumbing pipe and followed many books on it. That pyramid phenomenon is supposed to sound very fantastic. Do you have any. Uh, no pipes size, over there. The uh, size of the. Uh, or the the uh, pyramid itself, you can't stand up in it. Um, it's probably this high, and it's solid copper. There's no tubes. It's a solid copper frame. And really, the solid ones are the only thing that really work. The tube ones are very, very mild, and the effect is not very strong. But the dimensions are the same as the Great Pyramid, the standard pyramid geometry. It's a four-sided pyramid, just like the Giza Pyramid. The top of it, though, has a little device on it. It's an accelerator that accelerates the mind waves. So if you, when you meditate, you meditate stronger and deeper quicker. So you're out of time within seconds. You don't know where you're at. And you're not allowed in it unless you have a, a, the buddy system. Somebody has to watch you go in, and the timer's put on, and they watch you. I wasn't that good, but a couple of the people there at the center float when they get in. After about 10 minutes, their bodies get to such a high state, they start twisting, and they're just turning around in the air. And they have to be on a timer to bring them back down. Uh, and they watch their bodies so they don't fall on their head and things like that. But some of them are quite astute at it, much like the people in the East are at it. Uh, the accelerator is no longer there. It was taken from Billy. The Pleiadians took it back. They made it for him and provided it. They took the accelerator back so it's no longer on the pyramid. But this pyramid is solid copper. But it's all the walls. It has like a little edge at the side. Yeah, you go underneath. It's copper, right? Yeah. 
Now you go in, you crawl underneath, and you come up inside of the pyramid and sit down on your little pad and get into position so your head's two thirds of the way up, the critical spot there where the waves come in. The function of a solid pyramid is not to is to block out the world. See, all of us are broadcasting all the time with our minds, but we're not used to listening to other people's thoughts. Instead, our fields protect us from that, so we don't hear it. So my point is that we are living amongst everybody else's broadcast and plus all the stuff that's in the air all the time from radios and TV and everything else that's in the air. But you're just not consciously aware that your mind has to defend itself from all these field energies as well as properties that are moving in the universe. The function of a solid copper pyramid once you get in and the reason it's copper, that's the best defense against other kinds of field energies. So you're isolated more and that's what you're after. By becoming more isolated, your mind then no longer has to defend or protect itself, so to speak, from outside influences, and then can better do its own work. That's the concept. And then if you have an accelerator, you're no longer, not only are you not protecting yourself, you're turning up the volume on your own mind, so you just move forward on the evolutionary scale about a thousand years there, a thousand lifetimes very quickly, by suddenly being isolated, having your own field intensified. So there's a whole process Billy puts the people in the group through to learn clarity of thought, power of observation, to see things clearly. He doesn't let anybody in the pyramid who emotionally is out of balance, is prone to fears, anxieties. You have to learn to control all that before you're even allowed in it. So it's a whole system of mind and thought, which I'll go over with you a little bit on the next section. And once that's obtained, then you're allowed to use the pyramid. And then who knows where you're going to go from there. So, yeah. No, I never floated around. I'm not that good. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, over here. They said that they were, after the third year, they told him that expectations were 32% that uh, that's about where it was at. The contacts were stopped uh, because Billy's health was failing rapidly from trying to control the group around him, which was getting very out of control. Uh, once the people around him learned what was going on, it settled in on him, the levity of what was happening, this concept of being special set in on too many of them where they thought they were better than everybody else and they'd been handpicked somehow for the planet. And that thinking got carried away and the group just got very out of control. And at that point, this is, we stop at this point, it no longer serves our interest. So to them in many ways, and they told Billy throughout the three years, that much of this is a test to see how people will respond with open contact with us. We'll have physical contact with you. The people that live around you, we will not have physical contact with, but they will be made to know it's for real. We want to examine what happens to the human condition when it tips over, when reality steps in and you know takes over your current thinking. And most of the people at the center did not do very well. The original people all became like, <laughs> as Billy calls them, pit vipers. Uh, all snapping at each other, jealousy, infighting, arguing, suddenly everybody hated each other, fighting over money, who's sleeping with who, and it became a real nightmare. So Billy was like, stop, 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 this is becoming a madhouse, and then at that point they stopped it. They, it went a lot longer than uh, expected. Let me show you something. See these tapes? This is Billy's whole three years of meetings. Uh, there's stacks of paper this high, all of his notes. I took them and put them all on audio tape. This is the whole three years of his meetings, and they're in chronological order. As you listen to the tapes, it will tell you, even after about the third or fourth meeting, already they were considering stopping, because they could see that it was too fragile for people. It says, we can only take this so far. So they decided to kind of test it out. And all along, all throughout the contact, they were always very concerned about that. There are in almost every meeting, they would discuss someone living at the house, how they were thinking. This person is dreaming incorrectly, becoming very fearful. This person is becoming overwhelmed with their ego and they're starting to get jealous. This person is trying to make the other one look bad. They were studying everybody's human condition. And so to them, it became kind of like a laboratory thing. And Billy was kind of like sitting in the middle. He's got all these 10, 15 people in the house behind him that are going berserko. And then he's trying to keep his cool and get them to keep coming back. I think four or five times on there, he's literally almost on his knees, please come back, I want more, more education, let's continue. And they kept saying like, that's enough, it's time to stop. And at the end, on uh, the last contact in October 78, they put him under a, uh, what they call the probation for a year. If everybody could get themselves together and calm down, they would start them again, but it got worse. Instead, people just went nuts around the house and Billy says no more, so they didn't come back anymore. Yeah. yeah. Those uh, two volumes that one of those students put out really translations 
How complete or um, Wendell Stevens was the original investigator on the case. That's how I found out about it. The notes, Billy's notes, the 1,800 pages of all of his typewritten notes, uh, Wendell has a set and I have a set. And Wendell made the messages from the Pleiades uh, books out of those. There, um, there is act, Wendell didn't change anything. Uh, what Wendell did was leave things out that he didn't think people were really ready to hear. And mostly that was pretty much all the spiritual stuff. Wendell's not comfortable with that. Uh, you must remember that Wendell's more of a nuts and bolts, chase the UFO picture kind of guy. Uh, so he, it was his decision just to leave a lot of that out of the books. But uh, from what I've read in him, he was, Wendell didn't make any effort, neither did I, to try to change anything. And we just figured, let the marbles fall wherever they do. Uh, my book, The Pleiadian Mission, is a little different. I actually went to Switzerland because Wendell and Lee wouldn't give me all the notes. And so when I was traveling on my next trip, I said, I'll just go to Switzerland and get them myself. So when I did, I was interested in all the stuff that wasn't in the messages books. Uh, of course, the messages books weren't all out yet at that point. So what's in mine is uh, pretty much most of the book is 67%, 60 to 70%, mostly the spiritual stuff, which is what I was particularly interested in. The book isn't about the UFO case. It's about the Pleiadians, how they live, uh, why they came here, all about Earth, our history, what a creation is, what a universe is, all about the incarnation and the cycles. And everything. These are the things, the questions that I had, and that's predominantly what's in my book. So. So your book is, is your book a summary down? Yeah, in my words. Yeah. And I think in some ways, uh, not to put Wendell's down at all, I'm a big Wendell fan, I love the guy, but my book is probably more accurate at the things I talk about in, uh, than his because Wendell wasn't interested in a lot of those things. Wendell felt obligated to put it out, but wasn't, didn't care that too, too much about it. And there's a lot of places in Billings notes where things are not explained well, and then they just didn't get it right, and then later on they fixed it, and Wendell didn't know about that. So Wendell didn't uh, take the effort really to like, you know, look into things that much because he wasn't that interested in it. Of course, I've got one set of them. I used to make sets of them every now and then for study groups, people, you know, the whole pile of them. Yeah, that it's, uh, well, they were translated by a German student who didn't speak English. So he got a dictionary and transliterated it, just word for word without fixing the grammar. So it's when you, as you read it, after you read the first few pages, that you're about getting a headache trying to figure out where the adjectives are. Why isn't the adjective over here? We don't speak that way. But then you get used to it. You get a flow after a while, and you kind of look at sentence by sentence, and then you start you know, reading them a little bit better. So the translations are lousy. The first three books of the 18 books, I had translated in beautiful English. I paid $2,500 a book to a translator. I was going to do the whole 18 and put them out on the market. And I just gave up. I couldn't afford it for one thing. And at about that point is when I decided to get out of the figure, so I just gave up. And I had put the whole thing on audio tape, so I figured that was enough. And then I picked out the more interesting parts of all the notes and put it in the Pleiadian mission book and stopped there. You know, it's just too big of a task. You have to do the whole thing. There's also some other books that Billy uh, didn't give me, but which I read over there. Uh, there was two more books that uh, Wendell doesn't have and I don't have. There's actually 20 sets of the books. But the last two, there's very little information from the ETs at all in it. The last two are all about the people in the house arguing. <laughs> They're all the fighting. People were suing each other. One guy called the sheriff on another guy. And somebody's sleeping with somebody. You know, no, it's just it's just a big soap opera, and that's why he never released those. He never gave them to Wendell either. It's, it's a real interesting study of what happened to a small group of people in a remote area when something like this happens to them. You know, they were just overwhelmed with it, and the human condition went crazy. So you know, now none of us would do anything like that, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but yes, um, you know, I could write a whole other book just on the soap opera of my life inside the figure. You know, all the, the stories and everything. But but I'm not so much into the messenger. I'm into the message. So I really wasn't looking at any of that. You know, I, I went over there for my own self to get educated, and that's all I really paid attention to. Yeah. Well, let's take a little seat break. I see a lot of people squirming. And uh, men's room this way, and ladies' room is that way, yes. and I'll be at the table. He's down, and they're punching everything. You might want to uh, squirm around in your seats just a little bit so you can see the TV. Uh, I've got a little extra videotape you might kind of enjoy. Um, I mentioned earlier about those of you who are on the way home tonight might catch a ride and get to go see a few things. 
What kind of food? Meyer says he never saw them eat anything but like apples and peaches and oranges, just fruits and stuff they don't eat. Uh, he says in their homes there's no kitchens, they don't make meals. He says basically they almost don't eat. <laughs> yeah. They would just go nuts at a jack-in-the-box, I imagine, you know. <laughs> he says they just they kind of munch. He says they don't have to eat very much. They eat very small quantities. Uh, and something in their atmosphere controls their metabolism. And they don't get hungry very often. And they don't sleep very much. They go sleep like an hour and a half and two hours on a 24-hour day cycle. But he says they're in deep REM within a couple of minutes. They just fall out like they're dead. They wake up in about two hours and they're totally revitalized. And a lot of them sleep even less than that. So he says they're far more mental. They've gotten to a point with their own evolution where they're more in control of their whole body mentally. And uh, so things are a little different. You know, we're a little out of control with our body. So you know. um, what I've got on the tape, I've been up here a couple of times before. And usually I try to bring some new things for every time when I come around. I've got several tapes laying around the house that I've gotten in various places. What's on this tape? And I, I, had an, I wasn't going to show the tape of the other planets and the mothership of Jupiter and the dinosaurs and things, but uh, I had four or five people ask me at the table, so I, I think it's on this tape. So we'll, we'll start it up and see if it's in the right spot. But I should tell you a little bit about what it is. So, you know, I know this is a fringe group, but I don't want anybody falling off their chairs there. So. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, that you did get a chance to write on one of these, and you said, just as a lark, gee, could you take me up and show me some other planets? And they do, and you start seeing satellites and other equipment around Mars and so forth and start asking questions. And they tell you, well, there are projects going on on your own planet that are already going up to the moon and Mars that they're not telling you about. And these, these satellites you're looking at in this equipment is part of joint efforts by America and Russia and one group, and also the Germans, the technologists who survived World War II and on their own are already building communities up there. They're way ahead of everybody else. So there's some stuff up here that you're not seeing on the evening news. So I'm going to show you a couple of those things as well. Uh, at one point, Bill asked if it was possible to go back in time and actually see dinosaurs. He was just, I think, kind of goofing to see if it was possible. And they says, well, yeah, it's possible if you would like to do that. So the, the pictures, there's four or five pictures on here of dinosaurs and of a prehistoric Earth. I, like I tell everybody, I can't tell you if they're real or not. They're just interesting to kind of look at. He says he went back in time to a prehistoric planet that he actually got out of the ship and saw prehistoric creatures. He got back in the ship with his camera and took some pictures of them. So those should be on here too if I've got the tape anywhere close to the right place. And then I uh, brought with me, which um, I haven't shown in quite a while, just for you to see. It's a few minutes of the crafts flying in and zipping around a little bit. Uh, there's several different segments and uh, we can look a little bit at that. And then I want to go over some of the mind and spirit things. Okay. Last time I was up here, we talked about uh, doing like a workshop on the weekends for people who are interested in more of the spiritual stuff. And we uh, were thinking about doing one this Saturday, but that's not working out. So I'm going to go over a little bit tonight about what we do at the workshops and I'll give you a taste of what we'll do. And then for those of you that are interested, uh, we'll get together with Charles and uh, we'll come back up this summer sometime when we can get it organized. And then we'll do it on a weekend. We can do it one day or two day. If we do all of it, it takes me two days just to get through everything. If, uh, if there's enough of you that are serious about doing it. I have my own copper pyramid that Billy made for me uh, that we use in groups. And I'll teach you some meditations. And I'll teach you some of the mind things, different areas of your mind, how to use the symbols and find them. So it's kind of fun stuff if you're interested in following that kind of path as well as we'll go over some things about the universe and how our cycles, or incarnation, how the rings are formed, and we'll have some fun with that and try some things. So um, we'll do a little bit of that tonight. I'll go over just a little bit. Uh, so let me see what I'm at on this tape and see if I'm anywhere close to where I want to be. Oh, yes, here's Venus. Uh, it's first flight around our solar system. Here's a picture of Mars. By the way, this is not a professional tape. Uh, as you can see, these pictures are in a picture album, and I've just got my camcorder out, and Wendell and I are flipping through the pictures, so this is not a produced tape for you to look at, so it'll probably never be on the market, but at least you get a chance to see some of these pictures. This is Mars just from a different direction with the sun uh, very bright on it. 
Now, uh, here is Mars, but here's one of these satellites. It's in orbit around Mars, made on Earth, unannounced, and is in orbit. This is the spring of 1976, and this device is in orbit around Mars. I don't know exactly who made it or who put it up there. Here's another one. This is Mars again, and here's uh, the light panels, solar panels, and uh, the satellite equipment in orbit around Mars again. This is a different one. This is a dust storm on Mars. Mar Billy wanted to get close and try to take pictures of artifacts. You've all heard about some of the, uh, uh, the cydonoplasma on Mars, about the face on Mars that Richard Holden and other people have been looking into. Uh, Billy published a paper back in the 70s talking about that. There was a race of people lived on Mars. Uh, they had a terrible catastrophe about 186,000 years back. At the time, there was about 40 million people killed on Mars, and uh, they're all gone now, of course. Um, so there were uh, societies there, and we will find quite a few remains of their civilization once we get up there. Here he's on board one of their large motherships. This is the side or the edge of a saucer that was parked inside as he was walking by it. Here's Jupiter. Here's the mothership in orbit. They're flying into it to go aboard. It was 17 miles high and about 10 miles in diameter. He spent three days on it. Uh, they went to different places in our galaxy to show him around. This was the craft that was right in front of them as they were flying into it. He took a picture of that one. Here again is back at Mars. These aren't in any particular order. Here's another object in orbit around Mars. And look, here's an American flag on it. <laughs> so there's a couple of things that they put up there that the military's put up that we don't know about. This is a picture of Billy in a suit. He's on a prehistoric planet to see the dinosaurs. He's got a breathing apparatus on. This is a Pleiadian man, and they've stepped outside of the ship so he can see the animal life on this prehistoric world. Got his picture taken, too. That's pretty good. <laughs> this jumps back here to, remember the Apollo Soyuz hookup, us and the Russians back in 76? Uh, Billy asked him if he could go up and watch it. They said, OK. Uh, they took him up. There's several pictures here of the Apollo Soyuz hooking up with Earth in the background. Some of the wildest pictures he's got. I mean, just look at the vantage point, the planets in the background. How else would you get this picture unless you were up there <laughs> at that particular vantage point? Not a lot of people have that in their photo albums, you know. <laughs> you can imagine the people at NASA would crack up, you know. If you, they'd probably find it a little hard to believe at first that they don't have pictures like this. Here it is where it's just hooked up. There's Earth in the background, and here's the two capsules coming together. This is the top of the mothership. Uh, there was no, there's windows, but there was nobody in the windows as they came into it. We really missed out here. Uh, Billy shot, he said, three or four rolls of film inside the mothership, talking to people and going up and down the halls and so forth. He lost all of the pictures. They were all stolen from him. We've only got two or three of them left, and they're, they're really practically nothing. This is um, a prehistoric Earth. They're back in time. That's Earth in the background. That's a moon in front of Earth, and he's looking over the surface of another moon. At that point, they told him there were two moons in orbit around planet Earth. Uh, we think we're about 60 million years back. Here's another picture over the surface. Neither one of those moons is currently the moon that's in orbit now. The moon that's in our orbit now, they say, has only been there around 5 million years. Look at this one. This is another piece of equipment in orbit around Mars, and it's huge. It's like a space station, and it's in orbit around the planet. It's also from Earth. We haven't heard anything about that, have we? Here's the dinosaur pictures. Billy's back inside the ship, and there's a viewing screen in the craft, and he says he's taking these pictures. Here's our first dino. He's got kind of gold brown skin, got large uh, hind legs, short forelegs, and a head that looks kind of amphibian, like a veg uh, vegetarian type. Here's the second one. There's a bird here apparently dropping some food or something. That's Charles. Is that Charles? <laughs> <laughs> Charles dropped his food. <laughs> This, one, this one's pretty hard to see. Here's the head of some sort of creature crashing through some bushes here. Hard to uh, tell. I know it's probably hard to see these anyway from back there. But. 
just the idea that someone could actually go back in time just really gets my brain going. There's a bird. There's his eyes and pretty nasty looking teeth. The last picture after this one is the strangest of all. It's a plant that has an insect head. Billy calls it a plantum. They were trying to explain to him how the evolution of different life forms goes. How, in, for instance, here's a, uh, a plant life when the plants are the food kingdom of the world. When the plants evolve to a certain level of evolution in these lower order forms, here's a small head, and this head is part of that plant. There's these two little eyes. It's an insect, the beginning of insect life on the planet when the food kingdom has evolved high enough. There are seven different stages, they say, of spiritual energies or creational energies on a planet that create the many different kinds of life forms. There's a transition from one kind to the next. Ours is the seventh or the last one. Uh, we have to wait until the animal kingdom has raised the evolution of the body material high enough so our cycles can start. Okay. Oh, I didn't know these were on here. These are some of the Miami pictures. Um, some of the ones that I didn't put on the tape. Because it... <laughs> I'll kind of go through them here. Here's the kid in Miami. His name is Manny Escondon is his real name. He's taking notes. Here these discs came in. His girlfriend took the pictures. These are flat bottom discs. They're made on earth. They're called Vril discs, V-R-I-L. They're manufactured down in Brazil. Uh, they also have a factory in, uh, down by uh, in New Schwabenland in Antarctica. There's another picture. There's a new copter came in. Look at the first three discs. When they see the copter, uh, they start to turn invisible or put their shields up. And the first three crafts, they go out in a series, are just becoming invisible when he snapped the picture. It was taken with a Polaroid at a 30th of a second, so it caught it right in the end of going out there. These discs uh, were designed by German technology in the late 40s. Uh, the first ones we know of that were tested out were probably around 47 or 48. They're called grill levitation devices. Uh, as you can see, they actually fly quite well. Notice the nice V formation. Uh, being typical earthbound Air Force pilots, they're still flying in formation. Uh, we understand this technology a little bit uh, because intelligence has shot down some of their ships, learned how they're doing it. And when you hear rumors about how the Americans are building flying discs, what we're doing is playing catch up to the German technology that's been around since the 40s. Their technology has accelerated tremendously. Uh, they make two different types of levitation devices. That's what we're doing out in Area 51. We manufacture the devices in San Diego. They're put together by General Electric. We test them at Area 51. Here's the German disc parked down on the ground at a facility down in Brazil. Here's four guys standing next to it down there. There's a whole row of them. He couldn't count how many were down there. Uh, he, just, he had his Polaroid with him and grabbed a few short shots there. Over here's two guys here on a craft coming in. You can see the two guys standing here. And down here at the bottom, which I know isn't clear, uh, is one of these old bell-shaped crafts. Uh, many of you are probably not familiar, but there was a fellow named George Adamski back in 1962 who claimed to be having contacts with people from Venus. This was the craft he was taking pictures of. Uh, George's contacts were real, but he wasn't having contacts with anybody from Venus. The blonde-haired ladies that were inside the craft were actually from Brazil. That's where the crafts were flying out of. They've been making them down there since about 1947. They find it very convenient if they make contact or land somewhere to tell people they're extraterrestrials and we're very open to it. If they tell them, hi, we're part of a German intelligence group from Brazil, people would freak out. Uh, here's a, I got my camcorder and I've got my micro lens on here getting as close as I can to this picture. It's a very, very small Polaroid picture that's about that big and it got wet in the rain. We left it in the windowsill. So I've ironed it and put it on paper so we didn't lose it. And I'm copying it with my macro. Here's the whole picture. Over here is one of the old bell-shaped discs. There's one in the air. Notice the platforms they're sitting on. There's a guy standing here. There's a guy over here just coming out of this disc. I'm trying to get real close to the bottom of it here so we can see what they're like. This is an area, if you look on a map, I've got a little videotape over there if you're interested in learning more about this uh, information called Space Cities. Uh, I've narrowed it down to about within a 200 mile range where this facility is at and what they're doing down there. Here's the guy standing there. 
But they'll sit down on the platforms. Remember earlier I was telling you about how the condensers charge out the bottom that have to charge the field up? If you get too close to the earth, the charge dissipates because it's grounded. These metal platforms, they sit them down on the platforms, then they can keep the ship charged up. And if they need to take back off right away, they can. They don't have to wait for the ship to charge back up. The platforms charge them up for them so they can lift right back off. If they would set it down without the platform on the tripod legs, they've got to go through the process again of charging the capacitors up, which takes three to four minutes. So if they're in a hurry to get away, they're in big trouble. These old bell-shaped discs actually have three Mercedes-Benz truck engines in them, driving the magnetic field. This was their first design that they made. This is the first ones that the Germans built. These craft here were under consideration and they were working on them in the end of World War II. When you hear about Hitler's secret weapon at the World War II, if you go back and look at the newspapers, and that's what he was talking about. They were in hopes they would get these things up and working and they would still have a chance then to win the war. Fortunately for all of us, they did not. And we'd all be speaking German today. Uh, interesting side effect too, once they finally did get them up and working, they made lousy uh, war weapons because the field around them prevents you from dropping bombs or anything out of them. It ignites the bombs. So it took them a while. They don't even have weapons on them for a while. And then they had to come up with uh, uh, other kinds of devices. This was the first pictures I saw from the kid in Florida of his German contacts. And to my knowledge, I still think they're his best and perhaps his only contacts. I think he probably had a couple of contacts from these people. They came, uh, they took him for a ride, it looks like on one or two occasions, and then perhaps they never came back. So it's, we found this situation on several people around the planet. So it's not an uncommon situation. And this is from ET technology, but it was before 47. It wasn't ET, it was nothing not. to do with ET. It wasn't. No, just good old German intelligence figured it out. Uh, I can tell you where they got it. It's kind of a long story, but basically it came from uh, German people who had traveled to India to study the concept of the Viril, the energy of the universe, and they were trying to figure out how to levitate their own bodies to move in time. And they came back and they explained it to people what they were doing in India, how they were trying to travel in time. And some German engineers tried to build a machine to travel in time, but when they turned the thing on and lifted up off the floor instead, they didn't time travel, but it floated and they stumbled onto the idea of how to make what's called a Vril levitation device. We think they did that probably the first time and sometime probably around 25 or 27. And then the concept laid around in private circles for a while and then became a, a potential thing during the war and then really didn't happen until after the war. These are Billy's pictures, some of his early movie footage. We got a car going down the highway over here in the trees blowing in the foreground here and here's the disc there trying to show him, you know, what the, just allowing him to take some movie film of the craft. This is a few minutes long, so if you want to ask any other questions, feel free while it's running here. I'll just kind of let it run. You can see they float. Um, the, the field around the craft that supports it, the ship is kind of in its own self-contained environment, so it floats on the gravitational wave, much like a boat on water. And when they blink out, what is the technology there? They were, uh, they really don't go anywhere. Uh, they figured out how to make them invisible to our eyesight mm -hmm. by the controlling the frequency of the field around the disc. Mm -hmm. It's just a trick. They set the field up to a certain frequency. It bends reflected light. We can't see it. You and I don't see direct light. We see reflected light. Sun bounces off of me, goes to your eyeball, and you see me. This is a demo right here, I think, where it blinks out. If I put a very strong magnet, for instance, between you and I, right here to interfere, mm -hmm. to keep turning it up, eventually the magnet will attract the photons that make the light and bend them, and they'll go the other direction. And you couldn't see me, but they can see me over there, but you wouldn't be able to. So that's the basic theory we think they're doing. They've just figured out how to cloak themselves by bending light and causing our eyes not to see it. Because they don't go anywhere. They were clear to Billy that the craft is still there. If you're inside the ship, you can still look outside and see everybody else, but they can't see you. And yet we can see optics beyond them. Yeah, blinks out. Yeah. Yeah, they're blinked out, and it'll come back on in a second. Blinks there was right. a Japanese documentary which showed this thing blinking out, and then it showed, then it showed frame by frame, it showed, it showed a green light emanation just before it blinked out. Well, this is from that documentary. Oh, I see. That's where it came from, yeah. Billy shot nine sections of movie film and gave them to Junichi Yaoi at, uh, in Japan. And they put together a stuff called Beam Ship, the movie footage. Originally it was called, uh, a film came out in Japan called Contact. 
and then the contact bombed at the box office. Nobody showed up to watch it. And they previewed it in Kansas City about 1982 or something like that. And people booed the movie. They didn't believe it at all, so they took it off. And so then it came out on videotape like seven, eight years later, and all this footage was on it. You know. Nobody was too interested in looking at it. See how the craft just kind of floats? Let me move on down because there's several on here. And Billy's not really zooming in. He doesn't have a zoom. That's the Japanese cameraman excited. What you're looking at is Billy was in his living room showing this footage uh, on his old movie projector and the Japanese came over with their video camera in the living room sitting next to him and they're taping off of his screen. So that's where, where we get this. There's another section we're flying in. I'll kind of fast forward through some of these because I think it's kind of long. But, and how many ships can you look at? Huh? This one's kind of cute because Billy's, he's trying to, he's walking out in front of his camera and he's trying to get them to perform some maneuvers, do something sensational for the camera and they don't understand what he's talking about and he will eventually get bored and just quit. You know? Then there's the craft sitting out there floating out in the background. If the best ones are still to come, let me move on down the road here a little bit. The ones that are made by the Germans are made by anyone else on this planet. How far can they go? We're not sure. We think the Germans have pretty much solved the whole problem. From one we understand, they are able even now to, um, uh, they're going to other worlds. We don't know the distance with which they can go. Uh, we don't know for sure whether or not they figured out how to be interdimensional or not. Uh, the ones that we're building are very beginning stages things where the craft are still taking off with rockets. They get up in the air, they turn the drive on, and then the craft then operates from there. They're not taking off and landing with the drive units. We're, we're, we're a little behind in the technology here. There's three of them out there floating around. And Is anyone else in league with the Germans, not with the Japanese? You know, that's the curious thing. I think at certain levels of security, obviously, on this planet, everybody knows what everybody's doing. So it's at some point up there in higher levels, everybody knows what the Germans are doing, what the Americans are doing. We don't know. We're the last ones to learn about it. But I tend to think that the Germans are probably, I like this one, that races across and then wobbles. Um, there is some cohesion, if that's the word, between America, England, and Germany, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. I think we've tried to get along with them at some point to get information from them, but the people in Congress know that the United States is not interested in having open contacts with a renegade band of Germans. Everybody's going to yell Nazis and scream and they're not gonna, it's not going to work. Um, are we dealing with the Nazis? Apparently not. Uh, after the war, they were very fragmented, separated, went their different ways. The group that's building these discs, apparently, are the ones in Brazil and the other factories over in Tibet, apparently have gone off planet, met ETs, and become very spiritual oriented on their own quest and don't hang out with the others any longer. So it's, it's not really very clear, but I think in the future that's what's going to unfold, what we're going to find out, what's been going on the last 40 years here on our own planet. Notice when they go to the right or left, they have to tip it up, and then it kind of staggers to the right, staggers to the left like an old Star Trek episode or something. That's because the, out the bottom, we're pretty sure the field comes out the bottom and has to push the craft, so it kind of slides to the left in an awkward manner. They're not really designed for slow speeds or idling. You know. So they can go really fast, I guess, but... Um, they're not, yeah, they're not very good at slow speeds. But this thing about traveling beyond light speed to go to be converted to like special thought energy? Lights, please. Um, yeah, one more thought on that, and we'll kind of get off the engineering here. Um, you obviously can't go that fast. Uh, we already know there's something called the mass speed uh, correlation theory, where we cannot accelerate any matter beyond a certain point and it implodes upon itself. 
Uh, that we already know. So even if I had a ship here today, we all got aboard for the price of admission tonight, we're going for a ride. We went out and got in the ship and got inside of it and punched the button to say, go to, where do you want to go? Let's go to the Pleiades and say hi to the folks. Well, we couldn't fly there in the ship. It would take, even if we had the speed of light, and we'd be going 400 years to get there, so we don't have that much time. So they have obviously come up with some methods to move the craft much faster. I've had a couple of talks with independent engineers that are designing things, you know, for uh, JPL and NASA on what their theories about it, just to see if they were thinking along the same lines at all. I says, how are you ever going to accelerate anything that fast? He says, well, you're not. What you're going to have to do is make it interdimensional. You're going to have to change it from a physical form to a non-physical form so it can move at the speed of subatomic particles. And when we do that, we're not sure what's going to happen. That's kind of what they're doing. They dematerialize the craft. It's converted into a non-material state that contains its own map of programming. And then when it's in a non-material state, it's no longer in reality, in the three-dimensional world. And once it's not there, it steps out into what scientists generally call hyperspace, which is another reality where material matter doesn't exist. And in there, time is different. A single second in the timeless is equal to millions of years in reality. So you can benefit from that, like stepping into the fast lane, and then if you have correctly included your mapping and parameters within your non-material state on where to go, you can zip up and down the universe then in hyperspace in a non-material form, going wherever you want and the clock is standing still. They said the idea of folding space isn't real, it's a clever thought, but that's not really how you do it. Space is not being bent or folded. You're just changing your own uh, essence to do this. So then you go to where you want to go, and the real trick is to be able to put yourself back together and stay within the same time frame. Because here's the clue. Once the craft is in a non-material state, in this <laughs> hyperspace, if the particles that you are now existing in slow down, you come back back in time. You'll re-enter in the past. If you accelerate the particles relative to the speed at which they started with, you move forward in time. And think about this, if a single second is equal to millions of years in reality, it would take very little of a change for you to slip off millions of years. Get lost. Get lost real good. Uh, they said that the universe is literally full of beginning time travelers learning these concepts. And that, that these secrets are very closely guarded because to understand them also begins to unlock the matrix of the universe and gives you access to knowledges which is very, very dangerous. So they don't teach anybody this stuff. They say they guard it very closely. It's too dangerous. They being ETs. Yeah. It's not, not healthy to learn, and they say, until people earn their own responsibility with it.